Hello everybody and welcome to another conference. Uh, this time I've, I'm with Brian um, Kimskirk. I'm really sorry, I will manage to pronounce correctly your name. Uh, so you are a fantastic artist, you work on uh, Star Renegades and I think I will just let you introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you, uh, Natalie. Um, yeah, my name is Brian Kimskirk. I am the lead artist at uh, Massive Damage. I was the lead artist and in charge of art direction on Star Renegades. So um, I guess I can start sharing my screen because yeah. then I can walk through the slides. So yeah, um, basically, welcome to my conference. Um, this is uh, all about the art behind Star Renegades. So uh, Star Renegades is a, I guess it's our indie um, kind of tactical RPG. And I did virtually all of the pixel art for the game, almost all of it, about 99.9% .9 of it. So I did all the character art, backgrounds, uh, animations, and uh, that kind of stuff. So uh, we did have, we have a technical artist who uh, hooked my animations into timelines in Unity. And uh, near the end of the project, we had someone help assemble maps with sprites that I had made. So, but all of the, most of the vast majority of the pixels were uh, drawn by me. So uh, yeah, get into myself a little bit. Yeah, I had the lead artist, massive damage. Um, and uh, wait, if... did you? I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Did you share your screen? No, with I me? haven't. I yeah, that's One why. Second. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, sorry. Let me go back up the slide. Uh, and then right. I'll do that. It's all right. Okay, let's do that again. I thought I had. Okay, yeah, my sharing that... screen now. It's good Perfect. now. Good, yeah. good, good, good. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, I am the lead artist at Massive Damage. One second, I just got to get Unity going. Uh, okay, so this is uh, my work. So yeah, lead artist at Massive Damage, in charge of art direction, pixel art, and animation for Star Renegades. Uh, I actually hadn't done pixel art before. I uh, went to Sheridan for illustration, did a lot of drawing, and I ended up uh, applying for the job at Massive Damage. And I had... Uh, Halcyon 6 was the project that they were working on at the time, and uh, the art style was already set, and I was kind of known for just matching the art from other artists and running with their work. There was a lot of times in my, my professional career that they'd have a game that they were working on, they'd have a lot of art for it, but they wouldn't have the, um, they wouldn't be able to get enough of the game, and then I would have to go in and match the art style of the game and finish the rest of the game. And I did that several times before I ended up working at Massive Damage on Halcyon 6. So Halcyon 6, the lead artist before me uh, left and there was the other half of the project to do. So I had to match uh, his art style and finish the game. So um, that led to Star Renegade. So after Halcyon 6 wrapped up, uh, we needed to do a pitch. So we had to do a pitch uh, to, uh, for grants and stuff with the Canadian government. And uh, the initial pitch was for a spin-off kind of quick successor to Halcyon 6 using a lot of the existing stuff. And it was the very first game that I was in charge of art direction for. So I had worked on a lot of games, but almost always I was working under another artist. And this was the first thing that was entirely me. So I had a lot to prove and a lot of work to do. Um, so anyways, I was creating the art style, not matching an existing art style. Uh, and this logically after uh, iteration followed its development course and turned into a space motorcycle game. So this was kind of the initial, <laughs> we, we wasted about five or six months uh, leading the game in a completely different direction. We went away from pixel art. We were playing around with, uh, we started with pixel art with it. And then it was uh, a little about like a tactical grid-based RPG using hexes and space motorcycles, which was kind of funny. So we went down that path initially, and um, I was developing uh, pixel art styles for it, trying to figure out how we could do motorcycles. We actually, um, the one thing I was pretty proud of though, is we did a node-based bike building system. So, and it worked in Unity, it was pretty cool. You could actually assemble all different bikes and you could make it look really different by changing the skins. So uh, it was a bit of a segue and it kind of led us in a different direction with the project. But um, what ended up happening was 
we went to Gamescom and a couple of conferences and it just wasn't getting picked up. So we completely, we had about six months to pull something out. So we were out of time with nowhere to go. And uh, Peter and I got together and we had like a few weeks to a month to come up with a teaser trailer for a different version of Star Renegades that was going to be all pixel art. Because when we went to the conferences, they're like, you had so much success with Halcyon 6. Why aren't you doing pixel art for your next game? Right? And anyways, so that was kind of how that followed its course. And we ended up, I experimented with a couple of different styles. We went down a certain path. Um, and uh, I, we were referencing very specific things. So trying to get the feel of classics like Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy VI, the Castlevania games, um, and also mixing it with the latest pixel art games. So at that point in time, it's like pixel art plus seemed to be the big trend. And the way that I would describe pixel art plus, sorry, I, let me know if I need to slow down or anything. Um, it's all right. Okay. Uh, pixel art plus is kind of taking like a base layer of pixel art and then mixing it with other things. Oftentimes they do like big gradient overlays. You'll see like purple gradient. So it's like, you're not, because you don't have the same limitations they had on the NES or the super NES, right? We can have, um, the base pixel art, but we can do gradient washes and stuff. And that's what you started seeing with games like Hyperlight Drifter, Dungeon of the Endless, things like that. You would have big color swatches on top of uh, more simple pixel art and then because you're not fighting with that color limitations. So um, we had specific things that we wanted to do. We wanted giant enemies. We wanted no outlines in our pixel art because it was it seemed like it was a trend to go away from outlines on characters in pixel art at that specific time. And we wanted to kind of create our unique identity in that. It was happening in a lot of um, fine pixel art on Twitter and other places. And um, I wanted to put, these are personal things, I wanted wind in my sprite animations and it to be lit consistently. So with those art direction goals in mind, um, my rules in, were no rotated pixels because I feel like they take you out of the aesthetic of the game. Um, like I, it always bothered me in games other than like Super Nintendo games where they would have mode type seven rotations and stuff. Um, I didn't want any rotated pixels in the art. I wanted wind always, which was a pain in the butt and a uh, beautiful serene landscapes worth saving because uh, too many games were post-apocalyptic, especially around that time. And we didn't want you to feel like, what's the point in doing these fights? What are we saving, right? Um, and very animation heavy, which is, uh, so just lots of frames, big, sprites on characters and that led to this little animation sample that i did it's a very quick uh animation sample that i did just to get a feel for what maybe star renegades would be um okay so uh and from there i took it and did the waterfall scene which a variant of did make it into the final game so uh yeah from there with all that in play, I'm gonna play this. Hopefully the frame rate's okay. Mm -hmm. But this is um, the first teaser that I went to GDC 2018 with. Um, so, is it too loud? Well, now I don't hear anything. I will tell Okay, you. should we pause? And I probably don't, oh, I'm not sharing with sound. One second, let me share with sound. Oh, that's why. Uh, let's see, I think I gotta stop share and start it again real quick. Okay. Start share, and I just gotta click share sound in the bottom corner. Done. All right. Let's try that again. Let me know if it's too loud. Yeah, it's a little loud. It's a little. Is that? Okay. Sorry. 
So that was a quick cheated trailer that I did in After Effects with very little time um, to have something to show and talk about at GDC 2018. Um, it's kind of funny because uh, on the plane ride to GDC 2018, I ended up flying from Toronto to um, LA and I was seated next to one of the lead artists on uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 before it came out and we had like a four-hour talk about art in video games and how games can look like anything and that's kind of the odd thing about games right where it's all about finding an art style to match what a game is and not about what you know there there are no limitations in terms of uh you like it has to be this way or that. It's about finding what the gameplay is, finding what it feels like, and then trying to pick an aesthetic to match that. Um, so when it came to characters, I always did pixel art first, which I didn't do any uh, any other concepts or anything or like full drawings. I would do pixel art first and I try to create really interesting silhouettes. And then as time, if we needed more detail or anything like that, or if we were using it for things, then I would draw concepts from the pixel art so we can elaborate up from the pixel art. Um, so that kind of led me to, let's see. Uh, these are just sketches, random sketches in my sketchbook from Star Renegades. So if I had characters or moments that I liked, I would just draw them out. So uh, I think Bentley is, was my favorite, the robot to draw. Um, I had a lot of fun coming up with him. I have like pages in my sketchbook of just lots of drawings of him. Uh, initially, I had the idea that he was programmed to always feel cold. And that's why he wore clothes, like wore the cape and the, it, just because he always felt cold. It was like a test robot for that. I didn't end up going that way in the story, but I think it's kind of funny. Um, so anyways, just some sketches. And these were the concepts that I did for the key art for the game. So when um, we were doing the animation for with Brick Animation, the intro animation for Star Renegades, I had to do the character scene with all of the characters drawn from different sides, um, just so that they had reference to do that. So I did all of the drawing concepts when that came, and then I did all of the key art for the game. Uh, it was kind of interesting because I was really pressed for time and I was trying to do all of the animation and everything for the game. And my, my boss, uh, the CEO was looking, he's like, well, maybe we'll hire a concept artist to, to just do the key art for the game. I'm like, no, it has to be me. I know I can do it too. And then I pushed and I did all of the key art for the game as well. So this is just some of the key art that was used. Um, different style, obviously, than the base pixel art, but um, it kind of, guided the direction for uh, several things that went into the game. So uh, characters, there's a lot of things that go into the characters for the game. They have their large talking portraits, um, which were kind of fun to do. Now this got to be a, a kind of interesting point because when I finished Halcyon 6, it was actually the last week and a half. Initially they had for Halcyon 6, if you watch their early trailers of it, you'll see that they had yo-yo melts. So they would have just flat pictures and there was no animation and the mouth would just yo-yo up and down for the talking scenes. And it was like that all the way until the last, I think two weeks, right before we shipped the game. And then I went in in the last week and I redrew and animated by hand every character for Halcyon 6. And we did the exact same thing with Star Renegades. We had like a month left and I went in and I, I made all of the animated portraits. They were just static. And then I just went and animated them all in the last week or so couple of weeks of the project. Um, so one of the big things with Star Renegades is typically, and this is it's a harder thing to talk about with people that are not gamers, sorry, harder to talk about with gamers, it's easier to talk about with artists. Mm -hmm. So um, this is the big mistakes of Star Renegades, as I put it, and this is kind of one of the central themes of my talk. They're not mistakes, but they're things that cause problems. So they cause problems and they have benefits. So one of the things that I did as a sample is I doubled the frame rate. So most pixel art in games, in traditional games, and most NES and Super NES games, the vast majority of not the game animation, because this is where it gets tricky, because people assume 
they want 60 or whatever, 120 frames per second in games. But that's your camera movement, your game logic, things like that. No pixel art game has 60 to 120 drawn frames animated. It's not how it works. Um, so we did 20 FPS. A lot of pixel art games have five FPS for their character animations, not for their game logic. And the, the most good ones have about 10. And I did a 20 frames per second animation sample for the game, which is means you're drawing a, a lot more frames for everything essentially in the game. Um, so it doubles the fluidity of the animations, but also doubles the work. And this happened about a year, maybe less, maybe like seven, eight months into the project. And I had to go back through every asset that already existed in the game and double their frame rate, draw frames uh, everywhere they could. Oh, so I just threw this in <laughs> for, um, yeah. I don't, I, hopefully this is displaying smoothly enough, but uh, the upsides that it increases your fluidity, it gives the game a unique look because there are very few games that animate with uh, frame rates that high. And the downsides are twice as much work per character. Oh, sorry, one second. Uh, assets are more rigid. So it means that you can't edit things as well. Once you've done an asset, it's very hard to change it because there's so many frames for an asset. Um, so you really have to be happy with the concept because making changes afterwards is not easy at all. Um, one second. Uh, and your game actually, the size of your game can be an issue. So sprite sheets can be very large. Like, so this character here would fill up uh, around as eight texture atlases with the quantity of frames that we have. So if you imagine dedicating that much resources to a single character, and when you have whatever, sometimes you have six or 12 of them on screen at once, it can get pretty costly in regards to animation. Um, so this was a huge sprite, the one that's playing in the corner. Um, it was a fun one to work on. I think it took me longer than any of the other ones in the game. Uh, yeah, so the Imperium, this is the enemy units in Star Renegades. Uh, just one second, let me just pull Unity off and hopefully get it. And then I'll come back. Okay, uh, I wanted to have them be like mechanized where they were like modifying themselves and playing and that was the enemy units in the game. Um, and a big thing through all of Star Renegades is uh, pink was my art color for, I just, I like the look of it. So almost every character or especially the enemies, all of the enemies and all of the backgrounds pretty much have pink somewhere. So I kind of tied it in as like a thematic color for the game and it's used almost everywhere in the game. Um, and yeah, uh, you know, some body horror in the um, enemies, a lot of like tubes and stuff too. And they help with, uh, they don't it makes them more work to do because you have um, you have to do a lot of uh, well, secondary animation and overlap and follow through on your animation, which is like making sure that things move. You can see it on some of these characters here that like the little tubes and stuff they move in relationship to the characters. So, which leads to some of the animation for the characters and the enemies. So our game has a lot of states in the animation. So every one of our characters, we wanted to telegraph as much as we possibly can. So I think I say this on the next slide. Every character has uh, their basic idle animation for when they're standing static. They have an execution animation for when they change into doing an action. They have a defend animation, an activation, hit back, hit down. Hit back and hit down was something that I pushed for initially. And the main reason I pushed for it is so you can have combo hits, because if you have the same hit animation all the time, your character is always reacting the same way to being hit. And what I wanted to be able to do is have someone go smack from top to bottom, top to bottom, side to side. And by having two hit animations, you can vary between hit, getting hit back and hit down, and you can do more combo attacks and stuff like that. So, um, and every character also has a death animation, a exhaustion slash recovery and somewhere between three to five attacks. Some characters have seven, some characters have less. It depends on the character. Um, some of our characters are really crazy and they have more than one state. So they have, they can change like stances or states and then they have a completely different 
set of idle execution defend and all of that on their other state. Is it uh, displaying okay and everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. everything cool. Okay. Um, so rules for characters, wind is always blowing. So wind blows to the right, uh, passes from, from the left to the right on every character. Sorry, just one second, I'm just gonna see if I can help Unity kick along because I want to show it in a minute. Okay. Um, and the characters and enemies are lit consistently. So you can see the highlights on the characters come on the left side and it, that's true of the enemies as well. So you can see that the cape on this character blows this way, the cape on the enemy blows the same way on the other side. So it creates really cool visual cohesion um, and that I wanted yeah, enemies to tower over playable characters. The downside with having the wind and the lighting done this way is you can't flip assets meaning you can't uh, mirror them from left to right because it's immediately apparent that something's gone wrong with wind and lighting on the characters when you do that. So it uh, visually can be really nice, but it does cost come at risk of uh, flexibility if you wanted to do a lot of things with mirroring assets and whatnot. So you would have to draw another animation set from the other side if you wanted to accommodate that. Um, so uh, when it comes to enemies, mechs, 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 uh, big, crazy mechs. This kind of spurred from me making a couple of them. And when we brought them to shows like Gamescom or Fit Summit or wherever we went, people really seemed to like them and respond to them. And uh, they did well for us in posting and social media and stuff as well. So I had a lot of fun animating giant robots. I love like concepting, coming up with the ideas for them and animating them. They're very fun to work on. Um, they're big for sprites. So a lot of frames and could be a lot of work, but they, uh, I think they were worth it in the end. And they, I think they turned out pretty cool. Okay. Um, some more uh, big enemies. These are kind of fun to look at. But yeah, a lot of animation goes into our game, a lot of telegraphing and things like that. Um, in a minute, I'll open up one of these files in Photoshop and just show the nature of what it is. So uh, these are more organic enemies. So uh, two bosses that I put in the game in that regard, they were also fun to work on. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, and in regards to animation, every once in a while, uh, just try to have fun and stay inspired. So I, just for absolutely no reason in my spare time, animated what my dream roster would be for console exclusive characters. So I did a Samus and a Master Chief and uh, Alloy from Horizon Zero Dawn. And they all did really well on Twitter, uh, which was cool to see because I posted those out. But uh, like I was sprinkling Metroid everywhere because Metroid is one of my favorite game series of all time. So anywhere I can sprinkle some Metroid and Star Renegades, I was happy to do that. Um, but yeah, so anyways, uh, animated those for fun. And every once in a while, if you're feeling uninspired or whatnot, sometimes it's good just to take whatever the art style of the project you're working on and try creating some stuff that from games you love or whatnot in it, just to see what that looks like. Uh, so did that. Um, now, the big beast of Star Renegades, which was uh, backgrounds. So this is kind of a funny thing for me. Uh, sorry, do you have anything, Natalie? Or... No, it's, it's okay. No, no I, it's okay. funny. Uh, if you say it's uh, the big last boss is the background, I found it was funny. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny for me because when I worked on other art projects before, like other games and things, the first thing that I would avoid doing if I could was backgrounds. So I would avoid doing them at all costs just because they are a lot more work. I have more fun typically with characters and stuff like that, which is funny because what people responded to the best out of probably my work in Star Renegades ended up being the backgrounds. So sometimes what you're avoiding doing is what you maybe should be doing. Um, and that's kind of an interesting thing. So by doing backgrounds for Star Renegades, um, this one's not from Star Renegades, but the rest are. Um, so my background rules were storytelling through setting, like Dark Souls. I love playing the Souls games and they don't usually tell you much about what's going on, 
but you see the world and the world makes you the world makes you think about what what is going on here right it's just like you're in a setting and you're like what does this mean what does this area mean what is like and the lore is kind of things that you can pick up on secondarily and i wanted that to be something that goes through uh pink everywhere like i was saying earlier um, I sprinkled pink everywhere through the game. So you can see pink here and here and all through the sky and over here and there. So it's a secondary color. So it created a cohesion kind of through the entire game. Everywhere you go, every background, you're gonna see some pink somewhere. So it's like this universe is just obsessed with pink for some reason. Um, and no mundane locations. So that's the big thing. A lot of, a lot of games you play, the backgrounds are generic. It'll be like, this is a forest, or this is a field, or this is that. And I wanted to get more like Dark Souls like lore into settings where you're like, why am I here? Why is this giant thing here? What's going on with these kind of things? So uh, those were kind of my thoughts and processes. Um, so initially, all of the backgrounds were completely two dimensional in Star Renegades. Um, I drew everything for the game on a. One second calculator. So I drew everything on a 640 by 360 canvas in Photoshop. And the reason I did that is because 640 uh, by 360 multiplies perfectly at two times integer scaling to 1280 by 720. At three times, you get 1920 by 1080, so perfect 1080p. And at, um, sorry, four times, four times you get 2560 by 1440 or 1440p. And at um, five times you get 4K, or no, sorry, six times you get 4K. 640 times six, you get, yeah, 3840 by 2160 or 4K. So if you draw everything at 640 by 360 in your canvas, you can do some bleed or whatnot if you're gonna have camera crop, you get perfect integer scaling. So it means that you can um, not worry about fuzzy pixels. You can draw your background, draw your scene, and have that um, come to life and know that your pixels are going to scale properly. So uh, if you're working on a game and you know your canvas, the uh, opposite is exactly half of that. So if you wanted your game to have bigger pixels, you can easily do 320 by I have to figure that out. Uh, I don't know what the other digit would be, but it would be 320 by something, and that would give you exactly half. I think it's 320 by 240. Um, so those are good for a perfect 16 by 9 aspect ratio, so a widescreen aspect ratio for um, these. So uh, animated all of the backgrounds by hand. I can uh, open a Photoshop file at the end if we have time and show through some of these. So some of them I just had fun with with different scenes, um, trying to create unique and interesting backgrounds. OK, um, so this leads us, oh, this one is like all just parallax shenanigans. So uh, you always, with 2D games, you have parallax to play with to create the illusion of depth and things like this. Um, so that leads us to this GIF, this image that I did. This actually. Oddly enough, when we were at Gamescom, it was 2019, Gamescom 2019, uh, this one went viral on me. It was the number one um, pixel art on Reddit. And I found out while I was at a German wine festival, which is probably the wrong time to find out. And um, I was extremely anxious. And I think that there's, there's something interesting going to Game Developers Conference and going to is because I think that there's an assumption from a lot of the public and whatnot that when you find success with anything, that it should make you feel good and everything. And I found that the more successful images that I had done got, the more anxious I became. It almost stressed me out more to see that many people interacting with uh, my work, even if it was positively in, um, yeah. So yeah, so I did this image and it was really taking off. Um, the game was getting a lot of traction. We delayed how long because, uh, and we kept getting more funding for it. So we delayed. First, it was supposed to come out. It was supposed to come out every six months. It was, it was supposed to come out six months later. 
And then we secured some more funding and then it was supposed to come out six months later than that. And that's supposed to come out six months later than that. And then uh, Raw Fury saw the game and we met with Raw Fury and they were super interested in it. And they flew my bosses to, uh, to Stockholm, I think, Sweden to show the game and talk about it. And I, for some bizarre reason, this is like a year and a half into the project. I, for some reason in my spare time went into After Effects and mocked up the scene in HD 2D or what we call our company 2DX. So just purely in After Effects, I threw it all together and made a GIF just to see what our game would look like with some 3D. And um, yeah, so I call this, I think I call it mistake number two, because a year and a half into development, what does this mean? It means I have to go back and do every background for the game again in 3D. So provided that Unity causes me no grief, I'm gonna kind of show what goes into that right now but I was having problems with Unity crashing on me today. So I'm gonna pull Unity on the screen. Can you let me know if you see it okay? Yeah, I see Unity, everything is fine. Okay, so I'm gonna to try to open a scene, hopefully get a good frame rate and a good ability to show it. And honestly, I rebased everything. I had everything running great. And then today when I go to run, it was running terribly and crashing. Yeah, it's always like that. Yeah, so oh, uh, this it's perfect. is... This is the base scene in Unity um, for this. So I can kind of show some of the shenanigans that go behind the scene. So the illusion works at very specific camera angles. So um, we can full screen the scene view. One second. Um, there's a couple of things that we have. So I have in my controls in the, the, we call this Badger, the background animation design editor thing. So we have silly names for all of our tools that we built for Star Renegades. There's Badger, Cattle, Weasel, and Wombat. So Badger is our background editor. Cattle is our um, Cattle is our combat animation timeline. Uh, Wombat is our world map stuff. Those are the ones that I work with. I never touch Weasel. So, anyways, those are our custom tools that we built into Unity for Star Renegades. So within this, I have a, we have the ability to render whatever units we want in the game. We can switch whatever ones they are. And they do take time to load because, uh, let's throw, sure. Um, because there's so many frames in the animation, right? We have big issues with loading in our game. And that's an issue that we always had to contend with. So uh, let's just pull in something else, whatever. Yeah. Okay, so you have all of these characters and enemies that we can do. And then I have very specific camera positions that you can see right here. I have camera positions that I know the game is going to go to. So when I set up, not that one, that's unused. So all of these are ones that the camera will go to. So when the fight starts, it goes here and then it gradually eases into this here. And then you can adjust between your character player. And then when they do their special moves, it goes into an interstitial view and then it can pan a little bit. So I need the background to not break at any of those camera angles, but it's all for the most part shenanigans. So if we pull here and you see the scene, you can see it looks great from these scenes, but as soon as you go behind the scenes, you can see that at certain camera angles, the illusion breaks. So we make things as 3D as we can, understanding that the, um, the very limited, there's gonna be very limited movement and stuff on the camera. So this is how we assembled and then what we problem solved. Now there's very specific things that I worked out. I wanted the characters to be tilted slightly towards the screen to make them pop out more. So our ground is at an 80 degree angle and our characters are at a 10 degree angle and it gives them a little bit more pop but it gives them an issue. I actually got that trick from Legend of Zelda, Link Between Worlds on the 3DS where all of the characters were slanted back as they walked. And it looks, let's see if I can find an image of it. Um, um, so 
it looks great from a front perspective, but on the side, it looks crazy. Let's see, I'll open this image in a new tab, but I'll close it on here. So you can see this is what it looks like on the side for a link between worlds. Everything is slanted, but in your base gameplay, it looks great, right? You don't notice it. And I thought that would be a useful tactic to do here. So um, the other thing that moving to a 3D pipeline opened up for us, provided it lets me open another level. Don't want to save any changes. Uh, let's go to the raw showdown. Okay. So it enabled things like you can't see it in the, I gotta pull the game view back on the screen. One second. Come on. Come on, Unity. Work with me. Uh, Unity just crashed. Okay. So I'm glad I got to show that part of the demo, but now that Unity has crashed, I oh. will have to go to video format. I can try rebooting Unity for the end, but it's been pretty terrible today. So I'll start booting it in the background and then I can come back to it at the end if anyone has any questions or anything on it. Um, so our big influences for 2D references, 2D X references was primarily Octopath Travelers. Um, there are a lot of things they did well. There are some things that I, I thought maybe we could do a bit better um, with backgrounds and things specifically. And our characters were much more animated. So Octopath does a lot of flashy cover up with their animations and stuff, and it looks great for their game. Um, but they really, their their enemies don't have any unique attack animations. They have a five frame, I think it's five frames per second for their enemy boss loops. So very limited animation and a lot of overlay effects. And when the characters swing a sword, they just straight up swing. It's very basic, but very reinforced. And we had a different setup that we had to do because our, basically our, our game, was so much more animated that we wanted to reinforce the animation rather than cover up the limitations. So um, when it comes to it, it's kind of funny because people talk about HD2D and Octopath and stuff like it's new, but it's really old because it's what PS1 games were. So a lot of PS1 games like the Breath of Fire games, you know, Gears, Grandia, Suikoden, they're all doing essentially the same thing. The only difference really is that they operated at much lower resolutions and they didn't have the post-processing pipeline that we have. So one of the things that we do in our games now is we cover up, um, we cover up a lot of the flaws, and we're not the flaws, we unify our scenes with um, post-processing. So like in Star Renegades, we use ambient occlusion and um, we'll use color grading and um, you know, bloom and all of these things, uh, volumetric lighting. We have volumetric lights as well to unify our scenes. Um, and that just creates a visual cohesion among the game. And that kind of stops it where as on PS1 games, you have the units stick out a lot more between, there's a more of a, a contrast between the 2D elements and the 3D elements. Whereas we can mask that better with modern games using modern post-processing and effects and also unify with lighting. So, um, Really hope Unity loads again because I was going to show lights and stuff as well. Because um, we use volumetric lights and we use uh, regular lights and things like that in Star Renegades. So those are the advantages. We can light the background and the characters evenly and things like that. Um, 2DX rules. So the rules that I put in place to function within 2DX or HD2D, or what, we, we literally don't call it HD2D because Square Enix copyrighted it. Um, so we had to come up with our own thing, but it's basically the same kind of system. So pixels, this is my rule visually, pixels need to be the same size in the foreground as in the distance. Not, and this is something that's always at risk with um, this specific thing. So it's about scaling the assets so that, because I drew them all on a 640 by 360 plane, when I push something back, I want it to be massive, but it still should only be as many pixels as it would be compositionally if that makes any sense. I'm just trying to figure out how to word that. And um, this was kind of my rule for 2DX um, that I wanted, I didn't want you to have big chunky pixels or inconsistent pixel sizes in the art. I wanted consistency throughout. So it gave you the feel of playing a classic pixel art game where your canvas and your pixels were the same size, but it's distributed in a 3D space. Obviously the exception is the floor, you really can't do too much with that. The floor is going to be tilted into the distance. 
and it's going to have the pixels changing in size. That's just the only caveat is you can't control the pixel density on the floor. Um, we did end up using our own custom variant of a pixel anti-aliasing so that we could have anti-aliasing and have our pixel art in our game. Um, so uh, once again, I didn't want any rotated pixels. With 3D, it's easy to do rotated pixels, but I didn't want to do that. Uh, I still didn't want to. I wanted to have that visual cohesion. And you really need limited camera movement. You have, like I showed in the, the demo in Unity, you need it not to break in those camera positions. Outside of that, it can break as much as it wants, but just make sure that you have a framework where the illusion is kept. And um, one of the things that I did to get the looks that I want is I would, we had, I think we had five different lighting planes. We had our default foreground, midground, background, and overlays. So five, five lightings. And I could set different things to be lit by different lights. And that allowed me to punch up backgrounds if I needed to, or other things to uh, create different effects um, using lighting. And then the big one, combining pixel art classic pixel art with a modern pipeline, which is what I was talking about with Octopath, the difference between that and classic PS1 games, is that we can do things like lights and volumetric lights, particles, ambient occlusion, color grading, depth of field, vignettes, bloom, on top of our image to unify everything. So that the things that are 3D and 2D are, are at least unified in some way. And then, yeah, talked about the 80 degree tilt. And this enables backgrounds that would have been impossible otherwise. Um, so obviously enabling things like screen space reflections on the water. I think we used, we didn't use screen space, we used planar reflections. Um, but this is a video, I figured I'd talk over it, but it goes through all of the backgrounds in the game and uh, within their set camera positions. So each of these backgrounds, it's an eight minute video, so I might skim through some of it, but um, basically this, these were the frameworks and then these are all the backgrounds that I came up with in these settings. So you can see, you know, volumetric effects and uh, particles and things to help unify the scene. We have lighting from different positions sometimes in different backgrounds and um, a ton of pixels that kind of go into everything. Uh, the cool thing with it too is you could use this to really uh, make like in this forest scene you can see that the characters are like lit they're slightly more darker in their lighting and things and you could do other things like that to help unify the scene um so yeah there's there's lots of backgrounds that went into the game um the all of the grass i was in the netherlands during um gamescom 2019 gamescom 2019 and uh, they had a lot of, um, we went into the, the Kinderdijk um, and they had big swing grass like that. And I took a whole bunch of videos and I, I drew my own versions of the grass that I saw at Kinderdijk, which was kind of fun. Um, but yeah, you can see the unified lighting assets like this. We have a lot of volumetric lights and things that go into the scene. So, these are some of the backgrounds in the game. Well, pretty much all of them. Um, that's the one I did for the trailer in the top of the room. There's the uh, yeah, Crystal Titan, so on and so forth. This factory was fun to work on. Um, so yeah, lots of lots of unique backgrounds to the game. Lots of uh, different ways where I was trying to create personality for a game. Try to create a unified universe. You'll see pink everywhere uh, on all of these and fun volumetric lights coming from the eyes on this one and so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, this was kind of the direction that I ended up going. So it was a, a, not a mistake in terms of, you know, obviously um, it had pretty, pretty positive reaction in regards to the visuals of the game, but it was a bit of a pain to go back and having to reassemble and re-sprite all the backgrounds in the game differently to accommodate setting them up in a three-dimensional space. Um, yeah. More screen space reflections, things like that. Uh, sorry, planar reflections. Waterfall. This waterfall was a nightmare to animate. Um, it's a massive, I animated most of it. I was trying not to tile it by hand. So I was like hand drawing the different changes in animation. Um, 
yeah, so many backgrounds, so many things. So um, I drew, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Damien Mayence is asking, is the floor in 3D? The floor is a three-dimensional plane, but nothing is modeled in 3D. They're pictures that are more, so it's everything is built out of PNGs. We don't have any uh, like OBJs or FBXs in 3D, which is something that's different between us and Octopath. So Octopath had all of their environments 3D, and they tried to simulate P, so they're, they're modeled in 3D, and they tried to simulate pixel art by doing really low resolution textures with integer scaling on them with no bilinear filtering, because bilinear filtering will um, make the texture look really blurry. So they did that route to try to make their pixel art, um, their, their backgrounds mesh with the pixel art, whereas ours are outright pixel art planes. Some of them, I wish Unity was running and I could show because some of the planes, it's like I would put some things at different angles and whatnot to try to cover up different things. So some aspects of it, it's like this here on, oh, sorry, one second. This on um, that specific spot here. So this under plane here is another image underneath, right? There's no side of that platform. It's two drawings that are different, displaced at different heights to create the illusion that you're seeing the edge when you're actually not seeing the edge, um, which is kind of funny. Um, so there's, there's that. And similar with some of these things, like the fingers are all different parts as they come up. This, this one here was actually Unity is loading. So I might be able to get a little bit better of a demonstration of that in a split second. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, of different planes tilted in slightly different ways to try to create that illusion. I don't know if that successfully answers it. Um, Let's just see if there's any other backgrounds with noting the train. So there's the obviously the fields. These are kind of fun ones to work on. Um, animating different things uh, using reflections, volumetric lights again. Um, train. This is I should show you the train because it's utter shenanigans behind the scenes. There's nothing. It's a ton of parallaxing so uh, layers. If anyone here has used After Effects. One of the key features for faking two-dimensional animations in After Effects is using offset animations, where it essentially just keeps scrolling an image and moving it from left to right. So I, there's several features from After Effects I asked the developers on Star Renegades to build into Unity for me to play around with. So that our, our two-dimensional, sorry, our, our sandbox for building levels was more similar to After Effects in certain ways. So uh, things like, Overlays like Photoshop overlays, we have the ability to put essentially layers that behave identically to them into Unity. We have the ability to do lots of um, uh, lots of parallax and offsetting animations on backgrounds with all the layers like that. Um, some of it was a nightmare. We have an elevator level where um, it was more math than art in a way because just trying to make all the layers look right as they move into the distance. Um, if I can get Unity back up and running, I'll show some more details on some of these things in a second. And I'll open um, a carrot. Sorry? Well, just about what you just said, um, Marion Denmat ask any advice on what kind, of, what kind of custom tool we should implement to help artists integrate their work in Unity? That's a good question. Probably more one for the developer than the artist. Yeah. Um, uh, well, just we, about you just uh, uh, said that uh, you know um, some tools uh, in After Effects you ask to bring them into Unity. Yeah, so the ones that I specifically like, I was asking for aspects of After Effects and Photoshop to be mm. put into Unity, and uh, for us to do that the best way. So offset animation was a big one for that. Uh, layer blending. So like specifically with Photoshop, when you're modifying an image, you might do something like an overlay layer or soft light or hard light or multiply, and they're all different means of blending layers behind things to create um, different kinds of looks. And sorry, I'll stop sharing my screen for a second. Um, and I'll start sharing again in a second. Um, so you can use those things to create uh, specific looks. And so I asked for those to be put in. Um, also, like blending can be a big of an issue, bit of an issue with Unity. So 
you'll see in a lot of our backgrounds, we have lights that kind of go in the corner of the screen and they move across and making sure that they blend properly at different distances was a big thing that I wanted. Um, in regards to, I, I had them, if I can get Unity open, I can show you all of the custom things that we've built. Um, I think it might be open, but I'm a little wary. Just give me a second, pull it onto the screen. I'll start sharing screen again, and I will try opening a background and hope that things work out. Okay. Um, just pull this. It's not letting me nest again. I'm going to shrink this down. And then I can show those tools. Come on, there we go. It's not letting me scale it for some reason. Sorry about this. This is the Sorry. Sorry. part of the talk when Unity isn't behaving properly. Let me just scale this. If I can scale it. Okay, let's open a level. Um, uh, yeah, open the train. Where's the train? Where's the train? See if it works. Okay, it's running at really low frames per second, but it is running. Um, I have to literally quick play and reload everything again, but I can at least show some of the tools here. So if I pause the scene, maybe I can get a better, better show you everything, uh, display on it. Come on, move the center of the screen, see the same view. Okay. So in this scene here, is it going to move around? OK, so I pause the scene so you can see some of the breakdown of this. So if you zoom out, come on, if it lets me, OK, zoom out, you can see the window the scene operates on. So these are just multiple offsetting images. So the features that I was asking for, I'll close the recorder. I don't really need it. OK, so I'll just bring this over here for now. So, okay, so in here we have our base. So with each of these layers, um, specific things that I had built in, you can see I have off shader offset animation in uh, what I pulled in here. And then I can choose from there uh, how, uh, not that one, what was that? Mm, offset image, maybe. just click here. So from there I can choose it uh, moves left or right. It's duration, so how long it takes, so I can speed up or slow down specific layers, and I can adjust the curve of which it does. So um, we kind of built in these tools that let me do very specific things from Photoshop, and also with our lights. So with our light system, we have uh, subcomponent level subcomponents for animations. So we built in uh, where is that? So I can change the light color whenever I want, or I can adjust the float, so how bright or how dark it is, or I can set specific movements on them. So I just have, we have specific controls that we built into um, our light and our, our assets to do specific things. Another one, which is a kind of classic, let me open a different background and I can show it. Uh, I got a quick play, so hopefully it goes in slow motion. Hopefully it doesn't go in slow motion. But uh, another one that I built in was, I asked them to build in was um, uh, specifically uh, doing uh, water animations the way they did in classic games where you can uh, just distort in kind of a wave pattern pixels on a sprite. And I also use that for a couple of trees on levels where it wasn't as important to have the trees look absolutely perfect. So, um, those are some of the things that I worked on. Sorry, Nella. Uh, just to tell you, we have um, less than five five minutes left. So... Oh my goodness! I've yeah. you <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I should have told you earlier. No, no, that's fine. I'm okay. glad that I've I've actually filled up the time. I was worried the inverse would happen, so I'm not too worried about that. Okay. So uh, the other thing that I was just going to go over lightly is our map system. So we started with a straight up node system, um, and then we were trying to do like a room assembly system. And then that kind of developed from there to our first demo where it was like a node based on this pink planet. And then we had little dungeons and that was all done in regular art, uh, just pixel art outright. And then we had to expand that. And then we kind of led us me to this concept where I just outright drew this specific planet. 
And we were trying to recreate that look any way that we could in game because we were all pretty happy with it. We had these little side areas you could visit that I thought looked pretty cool in pixel art. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately they're not in the game in this way, but it was a pretty cool way to do things. And uh, my big inspiration for this was I like the maps from Chrono Trigger. So we were pushing for kind of like world maps similar to Chrono Trigger. And that let me make really cute map animations of every character in the game, which was fun. So uh, it was kind of interesting to have to do all of your bosses and stuff as tiny little animated sprites. Um, so from there, we had to create, uh, find a tool that recreated that. So we ended up using Tiled as the tool. So I can show that really briefly. But we had very specific means to do this. So within Tiled, you'll see we have uh, this layer of polish objects. So that is all of your overlays your Photoshop overlays, and then we've set them to call specific shaders. So if you click on any of those assets, if I unlock them, uh, sorry, not that one. Let's see, let's just grab one of these if I can. Photoshop, oops, they're all locked. Um, but you have these big overlays and then they'll call to a shader that we've set up for whatever Photoshop uh, blend mode they're supposed to be. So overlay or offset or things like that. Um, these are all the moon because that was the last planet I did. And then you have yeah more of these Photoshop blend modes. And then within our map, we had set tilted objects. So there's specific layers that are set to be tilted. So they'll be on a different axis. And then we have the other ones. And then through that, we could actually stagger at different heights. You can see that we have the height set over here. And then that plugs into Unity. And then we can have a 3D kind of stacked pixel art background. And then we had to do skirts. So these little skirt layers that kind of wrap around the outside of all of these locations. So I drew most of the assets for all of the tiles set up, all of the, the tiles and things like that. And then uh, Evan uh, made most of the maps for the game. And Christian made the maps before him. Um, so that is, sorry? I'm really sorry, but we are almost up. I just wish you have the time to finish everything you want to say, but don't worry, we have one hour to get in the details just after, so okay. don't stress too much. Okay, then I will end on that. Okay, perfect. So... <laughs> <laughs> the timing is perfect. Um, we have answered already uh, the two questions I've seen in the chat. So um, yeah. I don't know if anyone else have question, question but please, um, if you have que questions, uh, stay with us. You can uh, meet us again in the backstage. Uh, we will have one hour to answer every question and maybe you will be able, uh, Brian, to go into uh, a lot more detail about everything you like. Yeah.